Hello everyone, I'm Minwen Zhong from National Zhanghua University of Education. In the midst of a pandemic, I'm glad to discuss the notion of citizenship with you online. Before we discuss this issue, we must ask ourselves what is citizenship and what is its relevance. Let's take the example of vaccinations for COVID-19. In most Western countries, citizens are given priority in getting vaccinated. This means if you are not a citizen of the country, you may not be legally to get the vaccine. The priority will also be based upon other criteria. For example, the most countries will give priority to older people, followed by citizens of specific occupational groups. For example, the frontline health care giver or the military and the police officer who maintain the social order in the country. Today, we will also discuss whether citizenship is still important and worthy of attention in a globalized world, where the boundaries of national states are beginning to blur. There are four parts uh, will be discussed uh, in the lecture of today. The first part is the framework of citizenship. The second part is the expansion of citizenship. The third part is the hierarchical citizenship. And the fourth part is some reflections on citizenship. Let's look at this diagram first. The best uh, prototype of the citizenship sunset is the relationship between the state and the individual in terms of mutual rights and the obligations. And this relationship is mostly discussed in the public sphere. In fact, the relationship between the state and the individual is rarely discussed in the private sphere. Citizenship is the relationship between the individual citizens and institutions on the basis of which the individual has to answer the questions about who I am, what I can do, and what I should do. So what is the relationship between the members of a political community and the state? Which members are legally entitled to this political right and which member are denial to land. This diagram shows the simple relation between the state and the individuals. In fact, the state can provide some basic mechanisms to protect people. This includes the right to live, the right to work, the right to have property, and the right to receive education. The people must also have some obligation to the state, which may include the paying tax, military service, and the receiving compulsory education. And this is the basic relationship between the state and the individuals. Next, let's look at the paradigm shift of the citizenship. Citizenship can be traced back to the classical era during the time of the Greeks and the Romans. Firstly, the classical citizenship feature a spirit of collective actions of the people in a city-state who enjoy its citizenship actively, participate in the decision-making of public affairs, and pursue a kind of public values. Such rights were limited to male citizens, uh, while slaves and women were only in charge of the private sphere of household affairs. The city-state required loyalty, a sense of responsibility, and the civic virtue. Secondly, uh, the idea of citizenship revived uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries when the French Revolution took place in Europe as the bourgeois revolution uh, it was heavily influenced by the paradigm of uh, liberalism, stressing the equal rights of individuals and the rule of law. 
liberalism regards individuals as the subject of moral actions and suggests that everyone can become uh, a qualified citizen as long as he or she meets the basic legal conditions. So such a notion of modern citizenship emphasizes the human autonomy and freedom, seeing them as the cornerstone of a state or society. Therefore, the political blueprint of liberalism clearly distinguish uh, between the public sphere and the private sphere with the pursuit of a good life for individual belonging to the private sphere where the state's coercive power is buffered. In the 20th century, scholars began to reflect on some of the problems arising from liberalism. They argue that liberal citizenship uh, in the past was a monolithic, uh, state-oriented, utilitarian, and locking an emphasis on civic responsibility. Hence, a new paradigm of the communitarianism emerged. It emphasized the sense of blooming, reciprocity, solidarity, uh, trust among the social members. This is quite similar to some of the thinking of republicanism. As a result, uh, communitarianism and liberalism are considered the two main paradigms of modern citizenship. What follows next, we know the citizenship is basically from the particular to universal. It's gradually moved towards pluralism, notably in a multiculturalist uh, vision of citizenship after the 20th century. The multiculturalist view of citizenship actually attaches importance to the plight of the disadvantaged uh, classes, the culture of uh, ethnic minorities, the rights of citizens of different uh, sexual orientations, and the rights of people with disabilities. Hence, uh, the multiculturalist uh, believe that the recognition of differences is very important in constructing a civic culture and that only by recognizing differences can social justice be achieved. The British scholar Marshall was one of the first to discuss citizenship and treat it as a principle of equality. Marshall mentioned the citizen to fight for the so-called native right, including the freedom of person, the freedom of speech, the freedom of thought, the freedom of belief, and the ownership of property rights. When the citizen's native rights are infringed, they will go to the court to seek some uh, litigation or relief. The second part is political rights. Political rights are positive rights, which means that citizens can participate in politics. The right to participate in politics, of course, uh, include the right to vote and the right to be elected. So it is directly linked to the local councils and the parliament. For example, citizens can stand for election and become a representative in local councils or the parliament to monitor the government actions and in its laws. And the third part is social right, uh, which emphasizes the right to basic uh, live, uh, hood protection, including the social welfare, social security and social insurance, and actively achieving such right through the educational in institutions and the social welfare agencies. Marshall's three rights of citizenship have actually shifted from a bourgeois to a socialist uh, viewpoint, going beyond the civil uh, and political right, uh, which are still primarily a bourgeois right. Marxism, um, 
the other hand, believe that citizenship is a way for the state to hide the fact of class inequality. As the problem of class reproduction and the inequality between the rich and the poor are now not that easily exposed with the intervention of social rights, the capitalist state can achieve its ultimate goal, protecting the private property. New social movement and globalization have posed some challenges to citizenship in the last two decades with a blurred national citizenship and boundaries. So this is why Marshall's notion of citizenship has been discussed since 1980s. However, a lot of questioning and criticism were also raised in terms of his theoretical groundings. However, citizenship has some expansion. Canadian uh, scholar Will Kundika believes that only after the rights of the minority group has been given some attention can social justice be practiced. According to the so-called cultural citizenship, the Taiwanese president also apologized on behalf of the country in 2016 uh, to the original people in view of ethnic justice. The second part is ecological citizenship. Citizenship and the ecology has been discussed relatively less in the past after the 20th century. Liberal believe citizens have a right to use the natural resource freely, but when the environment is damaged, the republicanism is concerned with citizens a responsibility to the environment for sustainable development. Another issue that has been rarely considered in the past is sexual uh, citizenship. In Taiwan, the same-sex marriage uh, was legalized for the first time in 2019 in Asia, which is embodiment of what is known as sexual citizenship. Traditionally, men were seen as belonging uh, to the public sphere, women as belonging to the private sphere. To achieve the sexual uh, citizenship, men and women uh, should share the house, household uh, chores, and women should uh, be free to participate in public life as men. Second, there are the physical and the psychological differences between men and women so that the content of the citizenship can be tailored to suit uh, female or different gender characteristics. In the third part, we will discuss the hierarchical citizenship. Hierarchical citizenship has a five components. The first one is a city-based and also called the municipal citizenship. As an example, I'm a local of Taipei, I'm a local of Taichung, I'm a local uh, of uh, Kaohsiung. And this is primary a city as a base unit. The second identity is a federal-based citizenship. For example, uh, many people have a strong identity with the state, province, and Bundesland in which they live, uh, this will be a second federal unit of citizenship. The third one is the identity of the national state as a basic unit, which has been uh, discussed more in the past. For example, I'm a British, I'm an American, or I'm a Taiwanese. Uh, discussion on national state citizens concerned the most basic citizenship followed by the uh, regional citizenship the most successful of which is the European Union. It was originally formed so that the many European countries could join the European Union and feel like they were part of the European family. The United Kingdom left the Euro Euro European Union after the referendum a, a few years ago, which frustrated many EU citizens 
global citizenship also uh, has received some attention regarding the world, the poverty, uh, climate change, and the citizens' responsibility to the world, such as uh, the outbreak of COVID-19, which has a significant impact on the world uh, in recent years. It is truly a matter of all humanities, that's the militant coup in, Ma in Miami and the bloody crackdowns on Rohingya have occurred. Recently, European and American countries uh, have been donating uh, vaccine to countries in need of vaccination, which can also be considered as an act of global justice. In relation to national state identity, the first and the second identity can be categorized as a uh, subnational citizenship, and the fourth and the fifth one are more like a supranational citizenship. Let's finally uh, discuss a few questions related to what we have been discussing today. How do you think citizenship is uh, constructed? Uh, for example, the power the capital, the culture, or anything else. The second, where is the boundary between the citizenship and the non-citizenship? Uh, why do some people have citizenship and some people do not have citizenship? Also mentioned earlier is the distinction between the public and private spheres. The third question that the student may also consider is, do you think the development of Taiwan's citizenship is from particular to universal? Or do you have a different viewpoint? Firstly, what role does citizenship play in consolidating the democracy? In fact, as I mentioned earlier, in today's globalized world, uh, citizenship is being discussed a lot, especially with the gradual disappearance of national state boundaries. Uh, do we still need to reconceptualize the so-called national state citizenship? Uh, we hope uh, that students can also discuss some citizenship related issue with your teachers. Thank you for your listening and hope this uh, online lecture can inspire you in exploring uh, the related issues. Goodbye.